Hey, what's up, everyone? Happy Sunday. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, welcome back to another episode of the Twitch stream. Ought to be a good time. Yeah, so I got a couple hours to kill this morning, and I've been working on this project a few times, and I'm trying to kind of keep things moving, you know? So, having fun. Uh, what's up, Dominic? Good to see you. Yeah, uh, so pretty much what we got last time is we got to the point where we have this Zedlet, effectively, this what is effectively kind of like a glorified shell script. It parses a bunch of stuff from the environment passed by the ZFS events daemon called Zed, and it'll actually send that to a server. So uh, we have the command line type already pretty much ready to go. It's a short-lived binary. It basically just does this. It comes up, installs the signal handler, uh, figures out basically what sort of environment variables are passed to it, and ultimately pushes them to a server. By default, this is going to be over a Unix socket or possibly HTTP uh, over TCP, but we're trying to aim for Unix where possible. And on the server side of things, um, pretty much what we got last time is we set up the server, we run it, and we started working on a couple of interesting things here. So, for example, we discovered that there is this con context handler in the HTTP server. So what we do effectively is we store the Unix socket peer credentials. So we can figure out which process is calling us uh, in addition to which user is. So I guess in theory, if we wanted to really lock this down, we can make sure that only root is allowed to talk to the service because the Zedlet scripts are all invoked as root uh, for better or worse. So um, that's something interesting we could possibly be doing here. Let's see, we set up a couple of things. We've got both of our listeners. We're using my multi-listen package here. Uh, this is kind of like a clever little thing I did. I had a friend ask me, you know, how do you get multiple different listeners serving one HTTP server? And I think that one way you could do that is by having two serve blocks in Go routines like this. But this instead aggregates the listeners together. Um, and I think that so we fully implement net listener, and I think we also support deadlines, right? Yeah, so in theory, I can't think of any reason why this wouldn't just work well. So it seems to work good. We're going to stick with that for now. Um, yeah, so I guess kind of where we got last time is just the bare basics. Like given a push request, push being the ZFS environment variable payload, we accept an HTTP post, we make sure we have JSON, and then we make sure that we can actually decode valid JSON from the body. Uh, finally, at the moment, we're just printing things to the screen. We're not actually storing anything, I suspect. Part of me kind of wants to use something like Bolt or SQLite to sort of store a journal of what's happening. Uh, I have historically used Bolt quite a lot, actually, but I know there's been a lot of interesting work done with Go and SQLite, um, especially folks like Ben Johnson have been working on things like Lightstream or PostLite, which is like a fancy database for managing or fancy... Uh, Postgres wire protocol exposing thing for SQLite databases. So uh, I kind of want to play with SQLite again. I feel like it's been a while. This is a project that, you know, just needs local storage. So maybe we will check and see how SQLite is these days. Um, yeah, which should be should be a lot of fun. We're explicitly targeting Linux only. So like Seago is not really a big deal. Um, but for the time being, I do want to get some test coverage on this first. And then ultimately we can consider what a more... Um, uh, full-fledged API would look like as far as like storing things, keeping a journal of sorts. I guess there's really a lot of questions associated with that, right? Because ZFS can generate a ton, a ton of events. And I am concerned that if we just let it grow indefinitely, then we may have problems. So uh, a lot of things to think about. But I think probably a good way to jump in with this is to continue work on this and make sure we get some test coverage on our handler here. So we'll do that. And one sec. Do I happen to have any, hmm, hang on, just one sec. Making sure, okay, we're good. Yeah, I was checking to see if I had any GitHub notifications for, um, I, I sent a PR to Peter Borgen's uh, Unix transport project. So Peter Borgen, Unix transport. I introduced this test server type basically. So Peter has this repo that allows a HTTP client and Go to talk over Unix sockets. I introduced a test server, which is based on net HTTP, HTTP test. And uh, it's actually fairly straightforward. We're able to offload a lot of the code to the underlying server. Um, so right now I have this in a fork and this is pulled into the repo in a fork. I was just curious if Peter had had a chance to review these again yet. <laughs> Gasp interacting with the band on person. Yeah, I, no, no comment, but I, I've worked with Peter before. I respect his work a lot, certainly, um, but yeah. Uh, so let's continue, let's continue writing tests for this. Everything passes so far. Uh, we've got tests for the payload, various different types of events. 
Uh, now we want to write the server test. So for the client, we have kind of just like a silly little thing here that spins up an HTTP test server with a handler. Um, actually, I feel like we could probably, hmm, maybe we could repurpose our existing, here, let's go full screen really quick. I wrote this client test code before I started working on the server at all. And there's gonna be a couple of things here like post, push, JSON. Like, as you can tell, these all look a lot alike. So part of me wonders if, you know, we generalize the handler slightly and make it so that, for example, we can pass a callback that gets all the payloads and then put it into a channel. And then this test handler basically becomes the regular handler, which is kind of cool. Um, but maybe first, maybe first before I get over, well, it's not a bad idea. Like, I feel like it works, but, because hmm. the thing is with the client requests here is that the client will also be verifying. So for example, when we call push, it will also verify, for example, that it gets uh, JSON, uh, response status code, no, no content. So I think that the server will also enforce a lot of these invariants. So if we get anything that's not a 204, we're also going to return an error. So I think we actually can save some duplication here. So let's spike on that, I suppose. Post push JSON. Yep, got all of those. Um, so here's what I think we're gonna do. Just for the for the time being, um, on payload, I, I feel like adding callback functions like this in Go is kind of dirty, but uh, P payload. On payload is an optional hook, which is fired when a valid Z hook payload is sent to a server. Payload push request is sent to a server. If not nil, the callback will be fired with the contents of the payload. So then we I guess effectively what we're gonna do is like we get to this point where we've, we're kind of done processing it. So if the server or if the handlers on payload is not nil, we invoke it here, right? And then we can actually use this in our test code right here. So would be my intent. We don't have to export it actually because this is also in the same package, but hmm. I guess the question is right now, everything in this lives in internal at the moment. So there's no real need to worry about like what API we export to callers because we're assuming nobody else will ever implement this. Um, of course, we could change our mind. I like to kind of design things in such a way though where I still try to obey visibility rules even in the same package. So for example here, um, anybody outside of the handler type should not be interacting with this logger. Uh, but the on payload, because it's capitalized, even though it's in the same package, we're testing in the same package. Um, to me, this visibility difference kind of implies like, you know, you're allowed to mess with this, but you should not touch this, right? So I guess what we'll do pretty much is we will create a handler. Takes a logger, okay. Um, so HTTP handler, okay. Uh, new handler log. We do not have a logger here, so let's pass a no op logger. Um, new, actually, is there a discard logger now? Log that default. I, you know, I could have sworn there was a proposal for like a discarding logger in the package. I don't remember if that actually made it into 118 or not. Set output, default. So it would seem not, at least according to a glance here, I don't see anything that indicates there's like a discarding logger in this package. But effectively what we're doing is we're, we're at, we want like a no op logger. So we'll just do the usual sort of thing. So log new, uh, IO discard. Prefix empty and then no flags, right? So discard all of the logs. Pass payload to PC. Uh, what's going on, Jimmy? Good to see you. One sec. Uh, 
HTTP handler. Oh, type assert. Ah. Uh, yeah, so right now the handler type is unexported because it just returns an HTTP handler, but, hmm. Happy Sunday, sir. Yeah, happy Sunday to you as well. Hope you're doing well. Okay, um, let's rework this just slightly. So we're gonna export the handler. Um, we are going to, oh, actually, handler. Handler, serve HTTP. Copy the signature from down here. Uh, hey, is your OBS reporting any drop frames, connection problems, or is my internet crapping? Uh, it says I've dropped zero frames. So it's possible it's Twitch. It's possible that it's your internet. I'm not sure. Uh, according to OBS, I've dropped zero frames. And isn't there something about like more stats? Let's see here. Docs, stats. Oh, okay, so it says I have missed, it says I've dropped two frames due to rendering lag. Hmm. That's surprising at 3900X, but anyway. Damn, yeah, sorry. Jimmy says it seems fine. Yeah, it's a bummer. Uh, you think there's an optimization for IO discard? Uh, probably, I guess. Oh, yeah. Interesting, that's cool. That's That's news to me, actually. Twitch isn't like me then. Two frames is approximately nothing. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, okay, this is this is cool. I had no idea there was an optimization. Um, not that I not that I really care about the logging performance of my test, but that's that's cool to know. <laughs> I so what I thought is that there may have been like a log discard now or something, but apparently not. Um, you shared a link. Is that about the optimization? Oh, optimize. Okay. So this was done in. September 9th, 2021. Interesting. Okay, cool. That's that's new to me. Thank you for sharing. There's a optimization here for um, IO discard that uh, Ember Body posted in the channel here. So check that out if you are curious. So this needs to implement this interface. We're just going to delegate to the underlying mux. Uh, return h mux serve http wr. Um, hmm. it's not quite, is this right? No, this seems a little weird. So we need to store the mux in the handler, but so now we're getting into like kind of like circular pointers here. This is a little awkward now that I added this mux type. Um, okay, so we have the mux, we have h push on the mux, and then ultimately I guess that we h mux equals mux. This works, right? Like this this feels awkward though. Like I, I guess I didn't realize how weird this would be. We construct, we partially construct the handler because we need push and then we ultimately add the mux later and the mux is what we're gonna call into. So this feels not right. If only you ever use the standard library of logger, LOL. Yeah, for sure. We use, at work, we've, I've used loggers and zap and such. Um, you know, anything with JSON logging is good, but Zero log too good, gotcha. Uh, we're gonna add Prometheus today too, for sure. Um, sir, sir, HTTP implements HTTP dot handler. Cool. Um, and I guess that by convention, a hey, large data bank. Thank you so much for the 20 months, my friend. I appreciate that. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, HTTP handler, I guess that I hype train. <laughs> hype train drops enabled in the chat. <laughs> uh, hey, what's going on, Nate? Good to see you here. You figure if logging is ever the limiting factor of performance of your code, you're already winning. Yes, very true. Uh, that's why I historically have not put too much um, too much thought into things like zap and such. Like I, I recognize that certainly I'm sure they're well engineered, but uh, logging is never my bottleneck, right? So uh, 
I've gotten in a lot of arguments in the past week or so, you know, with coworkers or people in the community, whatever else, like saying like, do the simplest, dumbest possible thing first and then optimize from there. Like I, I shouldn't put it that way, but basically I think there's a lot of value in putting the simplest possible code in upfront profiling and then coming up with evidence to justify performance optimizations. Like, cause generally it just doesn't matter, you know? One liner, that's clean, I like that. Um, yeah, I just, I, I try to keep it simple when I can. It's just kind of my philosophy. You 100% agree? Yeah, cool, cool. Uh, there are folks who will fight me on it, to be honest. I, I have been surprised by how often people have disagreed with me or have tried to justify, you know, some of the benchmarking they're doing. Um, I just don't get it. I, I feel like you're wasting your time. Frankly, I, I feel like you're wasting your time if you're trying to optimize for certain things. Uh, but of course, I'm not writing their applications necessarily. I'm not necessarily, you know, building their thing. I'm not on call for their thing. So I will generally leave folks alone. But if I'm on call for it, uh, I am much more fierce in my argument. <laughs> so that's a good simplification. And now actually this tests our handler too, doesn't it? Sweet. Cool. That was a great one. Um, totally worth doing. So nice. Go ahead and shrink this just a bit. Uh, well, if you're logging each request at millions of RPS, your logging is probably useless, but still it better be fast. Yes, actually you do raise a very good point there, honestly. If your logging is significant enough where there's gonna be like a lot of allocations and such, then perhaps it does matter. Um, my personal opinion is that logging requests is useless. I think that metrics should be used for requests and logging logs should only appear for errors, I think. My, my personal opinion, but. Some loggers have patterns that heap allocate a bunch, which causes GC pressure. Yeah, actually, you know what? Uh, you no, know, you're totally right, Jimmy. Hang on a sec. Um, you just reminded me. Uh, go BGP. Uh, at Fastly, we were using, I don't work for Fastly anymore, first of all, but we were using Go BGP, and there was a log in the hot path, and it showed up in profiles. Like, I, I, can't, I can't make this up. Hang on a sec. No. Remove debug logging, yes. So look at this profile. Uh, Logris had allocated 200 and, uh, 2 million megabytes of memory uh, because there was logging in the hot path for an internet facing daemon. Uh, yeah, so actually no joke, I, I totally forgot this, but I have proof that logging was problematic in my profiles. Um, which blows my mind, you know. So if you're if you're curious, you can check this out. Uh, I had totally forgotten until just now. So we had to get rid of these these logs and speed things up because like it was actually causing problems in our application. <laughs> so you've also removed log risk from some projects for this reason. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so perhaps in that case, like maybe if Go BGP was using zero log or similar, it could be fine. Um, so I, I take back what I said. Thank you for thank you for reminding me that I even proved my statement wrong. Uh, you know, logging speed and logging allocations can absolutely matter. But my, my personal opinion is, is that like these logs should never have been here in the first place, which is why I just deleted all of them. <laughs> so in one of your projects, you have to cache the clock because the get time of day VDSO was too slow. How is that possible? I, I thought a VDSO was effectively like zero overhead. The other kind of zero log. Yeah, exactly, Nate. <laughs> um, I'm, so I'm actually not really familiar with how VDSOs work. I know it's like a fancy optimization. Uh, I thought it was just like effectively like a function call without doing like a system call sort of thing to get the clock. But uh, perhaps Jimmy can provide more context in the chat. Cool, um, that's looking pretty good. So now we have test coverage on the handler at least, which is nice. And we can also add cases here for, you know, post bad content type, bad payload. Um, why, why did the peer creds hook not get hit? Oh, the peer creds hook didn't get hit because the server has the hook. Ah, I see. So, what we're doing here is the HTTP server is configured with this con context hook, and this fetches the peer creds and puts them in the context, but this path was never being hit 
because we're not using the HTTP server here. We're just using a handler. So interesting. You really like Parka or similar projects? Continuous profiling to view profile from production environment and keep an eye on diffs. Uh, yeah, that's uh, continuous, continuous profiling looks neat. Yeah, Parka is really interesting. Um, I have been wanting to play with that a lot, actually. So at um, Planet Scale, for example, like, you know, our the service I work on doesn't do like too many RPS. I think right now we're trying to get distributed tracing in place because that would be much more useful for us. But eventually I would love to get to the point where we're also continuously profiling as well. So Jimmy says that VDSOs are reading magic memory instead of context switch. That's insane. So you are at a point where memory, like reading memory is too slow for the clock. Uh, that's cool, man. Hey, good for you. You uh, you win. <laughs> uh, instead of trying... Oh, so Dominic says, instead of trying to think of everything you ever want to log, learn eBPF. Yes, absolutely. Frederick's stuff has helped us find bugs and we trace everything. It's nice. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you're so glad you don't have to write code like that. Yeah, I mean, I I get a kick out of writing code like that is my problem. I get like a sick satisfaction out of like stuff like that. But, or, you know, me and my unsafe pointer yellow stuff too. But I, I'm not saying people should do it every day, right? Uh, Jordan, my project also spends a lot of time in Git time of day. It was hard to avoid that. Uh, Jimmy, if you could share kind of what you're doing, I think that would be an interesting blog post for sure. Um, perhaps you've already done that for either your company blog or your project, uh, but that would actually be really interesting. I would love to like read about like, you know, how you learned that was a problem and what you did to resolve it. And certainly if Jordan is running into the same issue, um, you know, there could be other folks out there who could benefit from that knowledge too. You think it's still slow despite the VDSO? Hmm. And it might depend on the cache semantics, whether you can actually do that, but definitely would be interested. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, hmm. I could embed the mux, but that feels dirty. I just don't like embedding. I, I feel like more often than not, it will get you in trouble because if I embed the mux, then any method on this, you get the ability to like register paths. No, I'm not doing that. Never mind. We're definitely not registering that. Oh, so it's in Chihaya. Okay, it's been a while since I've looked at Chihaya. I'm, I'd be curious to check that out. Uh, so you tried to move to open telemetry from open tracing, but you hit issues multiple times. It would be great to see a stream about tracing and monitoring. Uh, frankly, I don't think that I am qualified to do such a stream. Uh, I'm pretty far behind on the ecosystem at the moment. The last time I used distributed tracing was Lightstep at DigitalOcean in like 2017, 2018. Um, it's something that I had always tried to get going at Fastly, but never really got buy-in for. And it's something that we are looking at at Planet Scale, uh, but we're not there yet. So uh, unfortunately, I don't believe I'm the best person to do that. However, there are folks in this community. Um, you know, Jimmy would know a lot more than I would. Uh, Matthias Metalmatza would also be a much more fluent in that sort of thing, I believe. Um, Frederick, certainly. Um, so there are lots of folks out there who know a lot more about that than I do. But uh, at the moment, I don't really have a, a, a reason to get back into it. Uh, Nate says 100% embedding is often a mistake. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's bit me way too many times. Dominic says 90%. <laughs> so it's effectively a fancy peer-to-peer -peer router project. We have to timestamp when the peers interact. Uh, we only need the second resolution, so it's pointless to call the VDSO more. And Otel libs are hell. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask Jimmy actually is like, yeah, every, every second. Yeah. If you can, if you can choose to have like a granularity of like one second instead of nanosecond granularity, then that makes sense. So you start a go routine, which I assume is updating this over and over again, the time cache, the current system time, the cache time has nanosecond precision. Updates the cache clock value every once interval and it blocks until stop is called until stop is called. Ah, uh, okay. I'm curious why, I, I guess I'm not sure how old this code is. I'm curious why you didn't go with like a context here. I, I find that like the run and stop thing can be kind of confusing. Run called multiple times. Yep, that makes sense. Um, tick stop. Yep, want to make sure you stop your tickers for sure. Stops the time cache. So you load it from the atomics. Unix nano. 
Oh, cool. Yeah, this is really interesting. Thank you for sharing. The code, the code is old for what it's worth. Gotcha. Cool, cool. Yeah, I've I have gotten rid of so many start stop in old code bases by putting in context because like these things were spinning up their own go routines, managing their own concurrency. And it just ends up being a lot easier in my experience just to have like a blocking method with a context and let the caller do the concurrency certainly. But you're updating it to use NetIP now. Nice. Yeah. Uh, NetIP is sweet. Glad you, hope you like it. You know, uh, I forget if I already said this, but Nate says 90% of the time embedding is always wrong. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> You ported this to NetAdder in a PR back in the day. Nice. Yeah, I've switched everything over to NetIP as well. Like CoreRed was a pretty pretty big change, but so MD layer. Y'all have got me distracted today, but that's okay. Um, let's see here. Unreleased change log. Yeah, so this I did two commits and it took me a while, but you know, kind of going through switching everything. Like a lot of these APIs, like, you know, net adder IP to net IP adder, net IP must parse adder, must parse IP. Like there was a lot of search from a place here, um, but it still did take some time. Uh, you've got to bail good seeing people on Twitch. You need to spend more time on go Twitch. Good luck. Hey, thanks, Nate. Uh, thank you for stopping by. Take care. See you around. Uh, yeah, so porting to net IP is a non-trivial amount of work, depending on what you're doing. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I... I had to figure out here. I realized like, oh shit, I forgot to add. Hang on one sec. Where is it? IPv6 link local. This, so funk IPv6. Oh, doesn't matter. Anyway, we forgot to add a couple of constants or a couple of variables to net IP and I had to open a couple of proposals afterwards. So, oops. Anyway, um, yeah, we're not gonna embed this. Embedding stinks. Well, I suppose. We could embed HTTP handler, couldn't we? I mean, right? Like, like I'm not saying this is amazing, but then people can do type assertions. Never mind, we're not doing that. <laughs> I won't do it, I promise. <laughs> cool. This whole partially constructed thing does feel awkward, but I feel like it's probably fine, I guess. I don't know. It's the kind of like cyclical data structure that like Rust would be upset about. So you have the handler and the handler owns the mux, but then the mux is calling into the handler, right? So like you got kind of a, a bit of a pointer web here, um, but ultimately the, the push handler, you know, doesn't use the mux at all, so. Consider factoring out middleware for request validation. Ah, uh, yeah, I can still do that. Or pay, payload hook. Uh, when did you start at Planet Scale? You totally missed my move. Yeah, I so I left Fastly in early December. I took about six weeks off, and then I started at Planet Scale at the end of January. So it's been a couple of months now. Um, it's been really cool. I, I've been having a great time. I initially was a little hesitant, perhaps, because I wasn't sure how I felt about like working on databases as a service. But ultimately, it's just distributed systems, right? And there have been times where, you know, some of my specialties have already been useful doing stuff like with weird system calls or Linuxy things. Um, you know, certainly go, just go practice as a whole. Um, I've had a really good time. It's a, it's a really great place to work. I trust the people I work with a lot. You know, we've got great engineers, um, great product. People seem to love it. I'm, I'm really excited. So really cool stuff for sure. Um, oh yeah, I was thinking about putting the server, wasn't I? Can we do that? All right, hang on just a sec. So this is gonna be weird, but what happens, what can we modify on the HTTP test server, I guess is my question. So the server type, Oh, so you can modify the server config and then after calling a new unstarted server. So if we wanted to, but eh, I don't know. seems not strictly necessary. I think probably what I'll do is I'll write a test for the peer creds specifically and then stick with the simple APIs for everything else, so.
because I don't really, I just added this new test server API. So I would need new unstarted test server. And it's like, I don't really want to do that. From an outsider perspective, you keep an eye on both planet scale and tail scale. Both have a great team and product. Scale seems to be a good name. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I I've gotten the two names mixed up a couple of times because I've been in touch with the tail scale folks for a while as far as like, you know, working on open source projects and net IP and everything too. So it's uh it's kind of funny, you know? Um but yeah, it's a they're a good group as well for sure. Um yeah, we're gonna I do want to verify the peer creds thing. So I, I want to figure out how we can do that. Test client Unix peer creds. Testing T. Um, we're basically going to need to do this sort of thing again, but we're going to need to modify the server. So. You should have named offset to off Z scale. <laughs> I mean, it's not too late, right? <laughs> Spice scale. <laughs> Dragon scale. You guys are cracking me up. Okay, HTTP server. My next MMO. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna factor this out so we can reuse it. Uh, peer, peer cred kind of context. I filed a proposal effectively, or I didn't make a proposal, but uh, peer cred. Don't step on the scale. I opened an issue here to see if this is something we'd be considering to put, or we'd want to put upstream for the um, the repo here as far as the, the peer code repo. So I will link to this issue at least. Do MD layer. Follow up on. Don't step on the scale. That happened to me when I turned 32. Yeah, that's, I feel that. I I gained a little bit of like weight during COVID and stuff and I like lost it again. And now like just, there's been so much partying like since like the holidays and everything, like so many things going on, all these beer festivals and crap. And it's like, ugh. I uh I could use a bit of a bit of a break as well. Peer credit kind of context is a uh, HTTP dot server con context hook, which attaches Unix socket peer credentials to a request context. Raging in quotes. What's up, Ray? Raging is a uh, raging is fun sometimes. <laughs> I will say raging hurts a lot more these days than it used to. That is that is a fact. Um, so we need to bind to a random con context peer creds. I never seem to learn my lesson. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. There, there are times where I should learn my lesson and I have not. Um, yeah, I think we're gonna test this logic separately because the server type here is gonna have a lot more going on as far as config goes. So testing all of this together right now is non-trivial. So we're gonna write this little shim test for the time being. Let's see here. Don't I have? I don't have an air group. Uh, I thought I had an air group handler. Uh, hey, MD layer. Hey, how's it going? Um, let's see. What was I gonna? I was gonna do an air group thing. Yeah, I was basically gonna do something like this. So, do tests have context yet? Is there a T context? No. I think that might be uh, an upcoming CL or something. So we want to call surf on a local listener. Oh, hmm. 
Does this work? Listen and serve. Hang on a sec. So we run that and then we shut it down. So I guess what we do is something like this, T cleanup, funk, right ASD, no. Oh shoot, you know what? Um, I need Unix sockets here, don't I? I have no choice. In that. Yeah, I need Unix socket. <sighs> uh, see, now I'm kind of wondering if I do want the unstarted server API here because I effectively want all of this. Yeah. Ah, uh, damn it. The man needs his socket. <laughs> it's true. Well, shoot. I didn't really want the unstarted version, but I'm kind of wondering if I need it now because there's no other way to hook this in otherwise, I don't think. So either we do that or we, I don't know. Um, this is gonna be more work than I want right now with the existing APIs we have. So maybe, Maybe I do try to make the rest of this more testable, I guess, would probably be a better idea. Like basically I wanna do like a one shot, a one shot request and then clean up, I think. So yeah, maybe, maybe we skip this for now. So where are we at as far as test coverage goes? We need to write handler tests, handler bad request tests for sure. Um, okay. So this is all the stuff where we swapped out the handler. We've got the new mux. Yeah, okay. Internal Z hook, initial handler tests. Cool. So now I, I wanna test this logic essentially. So we need to go back. Um, client test. So what happens if we send a client? No, we wanna test the handler. We don't wanna test the, so we wanna test the handler. We wanna not use the client because the client makes sure that it sends well-formed requests and we don't want that. We actually want invalid ones, so we have to do manual tests, manual requests, I think. So, um, now that this, things have changed a little bit, do I need unexported access to any of these things? Oh, uh, we need the, the address strings, at least for those. For these, I believe we can move them outside of the internal package now because they only touch exported APIs. So these are all exported APIs now. Where possible, I like to do the underscore test thing um, because I just feel like it makes your it makes you forced to use your own exported APIs and it just encourages better habits. Um, this one does need to be internal because we do look at these strings, although I guess we could just make a copy. You know what? Let's I don't wanna make a copy though, because if I ever change these, I've had to mess with these a couple of times and I would rather not. We control the error string good enough. <laughs> yep, yep, so pragmatic, aren't I? All right, let's try it. So, So this test is the one that won't work right now. We would have to either make a copy or export things. We potentially could, I haven't made a decision. Or we could do the export only for tests trick, which also works. It might actually be better. But I think everything else in here now can be exported no problem because we have all these APIs that are available to us. And the, let's see here. Uh, it's empty for now. 
undefined v0 client test. Oh, that's right, the version number. Yep, that works. Okay, cool. Um, so we can make these exported only, which is good. And then for these, I think probably what we'll do is we will, ah, shoot. So here's a trick. Um, if you did not know this, you can actually have a test file which exports things from your package only for use in tests. So I historically named this export underscore test uh, const. So if we do this, client now right here, yeah. Addresses, default address. Values which are only exported for use in tests. So you can do this. And what happens is we do default Unix, default HTTP, default Unix, default HTTP. And now our test CDs is exported, but nothing else will. I use external tests, so I'm forced to use my public APIs. I cheat and export APIs just for testing. Yeah, I'm just exporting these constants because I don't want to export the constants otherwise. I feel like, I guess there's nothing stopping me, but I, I would rather just do this for now. Um, but yes, you're right, I am cheating the rules, but. You know what's interesting, um, is that Huck? I have been writing Go for a while, and I feel like my style has remained relatively constant or consistent, but I've started doing a couple of things like slightly different really recently, and I'm wondering if anybody else has this as well. So let's see. What am I, I think I had an example in here that I wanted to, um, this is a small one, but I used to write this now, but I feel like I, these are both like kind of cryptic, but it's like, I feel like this is more obvious that like, hey, like this, you know, you really shouldn't use this thing. Like this is not a usable zero value. Um, so I started doing that, that's one thing, but what I was actually looking for was I had an interface somewhere. Oh, payload, this, you write them in test files. Oh, you mean like those interface assertions? Yeah, I guess that would also be fine. I, I do them at build time, interface validation. Yeah, I do them at build time just because like I don't always, I, I just wanna make sure that if, if the code builds at all, it always gets these. Um, I generally have hated anonymous interfaces, but I started doing this, which is something I have never really done before. So anonymous interfaces are something that I have long avoided, but I think in this case, like, okay, that's pretty fine. Um, what was the other one? I don't know. You think you would do two assignments for that check? Yeah, and I historically would as well, but I feel like this is just more succinct. Uh, this is a more succinct way of saying the same thing. I mean, yeah, it's more lines, but I feel like, you know, it's like, hey, this has to be this and this, or if I really cared, you know, you can extend this as far as you want, right? And I guess I like that because then extending becomes like one more interface statement instead of like the whole assignment. Um, so there's just been a couple of little things like that recently where it's like, I would never write code like this before. And now I'm like, yeah, that looks good. Or I do these like one-liners a lot. Like I used to be pretty insistent on doing multi-line like this, but it's like, this is so short that this one-liner just looks nicer, you know? So there have just been like little evolutions to my style that I started to notice. And it's just, it's just interesting for me. Two different ways of thinking about it. Yours says payload has to implement this one thing and mine says payload has to implement these two things. Uh, yes, I suppose you're correct. So I am saying technically, you know, there's this blanket interface that is composed of both of these versus you saying implements this or, or and implements this. Um, I mean, they, they express the same thing, but certainly if your mindset, uh, yours effectively treats Marshaller and Unmarshaller as one unit, yes. I mean, that is my intent though, is that I want them to, like if you have an interface that covers both, like, you know, this implements this or this or both, you know? So I, I think of this like a logical or, I guess, or, or a logical and, you know, Boolean logic, man, the worst. But it's, it's yeah, it's just something I, something I noticed myself doing and it's like, I would normally hate this syntax. Uh, there is one thing I do think of that's egregious. Hang on a sec. So I love this package. But, you know, actually, I wonder if it's still. Uh, 
Where's the reporter? There is, at least is or was at one point, an ungodly large anonymous interface in this package, and I think that's egregious, but I do not remember where it is. Actually, I think I filed an issue about it because I was like, this really screws up Godoc. Um, yeah. So look at this. Like, uh, this is forever ago, but the reporter has this massive interface with all these document comments, and like, it was terrible. Like this completely messes up the Godoc. And I'm like, this interface is way too complicated to be an anonymous interface. Like this is part of your public API. It has to have a name. Like I, I think personally. Um, so let's let's take a look and see what this looks like today. Actually, the, the issue is closed. So index headers don't shorten. Not done. Is this if this is still messed up? I'm going to be pretty annoyed. It may be fixed just because they moved to, uh, because we moved to. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, I don't know. I still don't. You're against anonymous types and functional arguments. Yeah, me too. A hundred percent, me too. I still don't like this. I still like at least now it reports better in docs wise, but this is still gross. Like there is no reason for this to not just be a named interface. Um. It just, I feel like this just reads poorly, uh, but that's, that's my personal opinion on the matter. So yeah, I think this is totally fine. I would never take this as a function argument. Like that's, that's weird. Uh, where the heck were we? Were you writing tests? Yeah, that's right. We fixed the, so all the APIs now use the exported version, which is good. Um, It doesn't just read poorly. It makes it more work to declare a variable that arguments type. Yes, that's absolutely true as well. So especially if you take like an anonymous struct, it's like, oh my God, you have to construct the anonymous struct yourself. Like all the types definitions, it's like, oh, that is the worst. I That one is particularly egregious. And I've seen APIs that do that and it's just, it's not good. Um, we have all of this so far. Right, we need to write tests for the the bad case essentially. So these are all client push, push defaults, test, test, test. Okay. Uh, go please can autocomplete anonymous structs, which is nice, but you only use it in internal short code. Uh, I actually, oh, yo, here's another one. I did an anonymous struct here and I would never ever do this, but it's like, these are all things related to the Z pool and I want all of them. So I have historically never written this. Like I had three different variables and I was like, well, these are really like one logical thing and we need all of them. So you get the command here, the pool here, the status here, and then ultimately we do a check. <laughs> Hang on a sec. Hang on one sec. I'm back. Uh, my partner was outside waving a balloon at the window. Um, earlier, there was a, a robin. I guess this season, robins get pretty aggressive and like there was a robin like banging into my window for like an hour like i think it was trying to fight its reflection um so i think she might have been out there trying to scare it and then she just waved this up in the window which is pretty funny um <laughs> the enlightened way to program and go is to only use anonymous types oh gosh <laughs> sounds like php all over again you're not convinced my partner is real i can promise you she is uh we're on i posted on twitter hang on twitter.com md layer She's not. Yep, Ray can confirm she's not real. You think you saw her hand once on stream. Did I post a picture? So yesterday, oh, yesterday was sick. Uh, we rolled into, oh, great. There she is, yeah. There's uh, the balloon. <laughs> yesterday we went to, <laughs> yesterday we went to a couple of breweries and such with friends and every place we went was amazing. Like drafting table, it's a super good brewery and like they had this amazing stout, it was awesome. Uh, which has had amazing brewery, super, super fun. 
Akuma from Jackson. There's finally a good brewery in Jackson, which makes me very happy. Um, oh, yeah, a couple other things, but no, let's see here. I think my Instagram's public. Yes, so I can assure you Jennifer is, in fact, real. Uh, Instagram.com slash MDLayer. I don't advertise this one because, like, this is just more IRL shit and not, like, tech stuff. But anyway, I can promise you Jennifer is, in fact, real. Oh, whatever. Anyway. Congrats to being real. That's just some random girl he found <laughs> who doesn't have spare hands lying around. <laughs> yeah, I think she's making uh, chili for us for, for lunch and for dinner this week, which is going to be dope. I love chili. Um, but yeah, I, I think this was like, I was like, Z-pool command, Z-pool pool, Z-pool status. And I'm like, wait a sec, I could just use an anonymous struct. And it's like, that's great. And part of me almost wants to have like a method on it. But then at that point, I guess you'd be better off just like defining a a type proper like zpool contains zpool has like all these things are populated but this is also fine anyway uh yeah so we are going to write tests for the server side of things you can't have methods and anonymous types yeah exactly like i was just thinking like if i wanted to do that i have to give it a name or i have to uh fn equals funk zpool struct command you know it's like i'm not doing that i refuse uh with respect to beer did you hand it a talk for GopherCon eu in berlin or will you attend no unfortunately i will not um i really would have liked to but uh, i'm actually in a wedding on the same day as GopherCon europe so i was not gonna be able to make it anyway so it's unfortunate um i do we talked about this last time but uh all systems go.io uh this conference is coming back in 2022 in berlin the foundational user space linux conference and it's like i do so much weird stuff like i am sure i can submit a talk on netlink or vsock or packet sockets or any of these things and it's like i suspect i would have a pretty good chance of getting in um i so, you know we'll, we'll see but it's like i think that i have a lot of experience in this area and i could talk about something interesting and this would be in berlin so uh, if anybody hears details about this conference, let me know because I really want to go. I have never been to Berlin before. I've never been to Germany at all. Um, and of course, I've got lots of folks who are friends in Berlin, you know, from either the programming community or the Prometheus community, et cetera. Um, so that's a place I really, really want to go. So here's hoping. <laughs> Man, you all got me so distracted today. All right. Uh, test handler, bad... Test handler error is probably right. So 404, bad request, bad content, bad JSON, right? Um, so effectively, we're going to need to set up a server, tear it down, come up with some kind of request for each one, like synthesize a request, make different parts of it wrong. So I have a way I like to usually do this sort of thing. Um, I suspect probably what I will do. So first of all, we need a test server. So we can just call test HTTP, right? Um, HPC test HTTP. That'll clean up everything itself. So now we have a handler that works and a client actually. So we have the client, that's right. Okay, so we have the client, but then the, we don't want the client actually. Um, we want parts of this, but not all of it, because we actually do need access to, we need the server URL, but, uh, hang on. Oh, I think she got a phone call. Okay, I couldn't tell if I was being talked to or not, but. Cool. Um, so we need the test handler, I believe. We need the HTTP test server. We need to clean up the server. We need to point a client at it. So this is where we're gonna do like a default go HTTP client instead of like our typical one. Um, so HTTP client, and this can be, it doesn't have to be Unix transport, that's fine. Um, we're gonna do just a short timeout. Uh, see. So stuff like get, I feel like we need to create requests for all of this, right? Because 
we have wrong method, wrong content type. Yeah, so we're gonna have to create requests for everything. So error HTTP dot new request. Um, let's see here. The method, the URL, the body. So I suppose I could default all of these. And then I think probably what we're gonna do here is we're gonna have a function that modifies the request to make it slightly wrong. So by default, Uh, we'll skip body for now. It's going to need a slightly different set of logic. So error t fatal f failed to t fatal failed to create HTTP request response error and the response. The only thing oh we're going to need to inspect the response because we need to check the status code right. So c do uh, failed to perform HTTP request. And then we're gonna to want to inspect this. So something along these lines. Let's close this pane for now. I don't need the file navigator. I want a little more space for my terminals over here. The problem with streaming is that I've got these 4K monitors but I can't use very much space. The first shot of espresso, I assume. You pulled was perfect, now I don't get to play all morning. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I know folks um, Folks take their espresso very seriously. I, I love pour over coffee is my thing. Um, I used to work with, um, uh, at DigitalOcean way back, I worked with David Salis. I'm not sure, is David's Twitter public, David Salis? He just got this beautiful espresso machine. Um, oh, come on, Twitter. His keyboard, I don't know. So David's got a super pretty, oh, here's something. I wanna see the picture of it again. Yeah, so he got this really, really nice, fancy espresso machine. I don't want the video, but I guess this was caught in customs for like months or something, but like this seems like a really, really fancy one. Um, but yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. So I was like admiring his, I was admiring his, uh, his stuff there. Flare 58, you are a manual lever boy. Oh, you know this machine. Um, what machine do you have? Is that the mini? I have no idea. I, I, I um, you have to check uh, yeah, David Salis on Twitter, but you've never tried a manual, but it seems cool though. It's not the mini, I think it's the GS3. Yeah, I, I know I know nothing about this. I can't participate in this conversation, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, I guess we want to drain this channel. And if there's anything in the channel, we want to report an error because we would expect all of these to, so if len PC, number of elements queued in the buffer. Yeah, so if one PC and zero. Uh, then we drain the channel and then we t.failf expected empty payload channel, but got Sorry, streamer. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I just uh, I I feel bad because I just I just don't know anything about espresso really. Um, dash v dash run test handler errors. What time is it? Twelve oh four. Okay, I've got probably a little more than another hour I can stream, so we're gonna go for about two two and a half today. Advice: Don't start learning. Yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> that's great. Uh, that's fine. Cool. So there's a bad request, that's good, um, because we did not specify any JSON or the content type, I assume. So here's what we're gonna do. Um, let's see here. Close, close, close. You went from pour over to this and it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> so don't learn, that's great. The expected JSON content type. So I think what we're gonna do, this is a pattern I, I kind of like. Um, basically, we have a test table here and we're gonna construct what is effectively a syntactically valid request and then have a function that can modify it. So uh, the function here effectively will given a valid request it will modify it in some way to make it invalid and then ultimately we will check and see the output status code 
Um, so this is a pattern I like. So diff t fatal. Um, you want tt code, you got response status code, HTTP status code. Uh, does ZFS have, have to do automatic file compression stuff? You've never used it? Yes, it does. Yeah, ZFS is sick, dude. Um, would recommend. So really quick. So if I do zpool status dash L, right? Is this uh, what we were talking about? Because I don't want to share my drive serial numbers on stream. Uh, let's try secondary. I don't care about these drives. Okay, so that works. So... So check this, so my ZFS pool, I've got four hard drives in here and I've got two SSDs as the special VDEV. Special is specifically for, uh, special is specifically for uh, metadata and small file blocks. But what's cool, so if I do sudo ZFS get compression, or was it, uh, compress ratio of, well, everything, I guess, but then grep primary. Right, uh, that's taking a minute. Oh, maybe because my secondary pool is scrubbing. Um, that's weird. Uh, oh, that's right, secondary, hang on. Yeah, so actually Jordan, you can tell some of these, like for example, my virtual machine volumes are compressed by 1.49X. So I think I just have the default like LZ4 compression text 1.08, 1.16. Uh, yeah, so actually it does do a pretty damn good job. Uh, ZFS can also do like native encryption. So for example, like my drives are, my backup drives are encrypted and everything too. Um, yeah, it's great. Would recommend. And yes, Dominic is correct. Unfortunately, people can initiate RMAs and in some cases they can get a drive before you send in the other one. They use like the express something. So they will get a drive and then WD, WD or whatever never gets your old drive and then they charge you for it because it was registered to you. So um, I don't know exactly how feasible that is, but after I heard that, I was just like, why does it matter? I already registered the drives. So now I don't want to play games with it. Uh, Reddit's got me scared pretty much. <laughs> I, I don't actually know how feasible that is, but WD does not know your bank details. Ah, uh, yes, that's true. I suppose I have no idea who, how they would contact you or how you could prove it wasn't you who initiated the RMA though. Uh, you went, let's see here, you went full ZFS when a B3FS corrupted your last ray. Uh, I'm sorry, it's been great. Yeah, I agree, ZFS is awesome. Interesting, okay, so Dominic says the RMA process is that you enter the serial number, you give them your credit card, you get a hard drive, and if you don't send yours back, they charge the card. So why does that matter then? If I've got all my drives registered, does it actually matter? Because I just hide them because Reddit told me to, but all of my drives, actually my new SSDs are not registered. I should do that. Uh, let me set a reminder for myself. They're, you know, Samsung consumer SSDs. So I don't know what the warranty is like, but my Exos are definitely all registered. Register Samsung SSDs. We did it, Reddit. We trolled MD Lair. <laughs> It doesn't really matter. Okay, cool, Dom, that's that's good to know. They long conned you, yeah, you're right. I got scared, man, by Reddit. <laughs> Ridiculous, okay. Uh, are those Exos discs good? Yes, they are amazing. So Dominic actually talked me into getting Exos and I'm a huge fan. Uh, they are crazy, crazy fast. Like, because my, my pool topology is mirror pairs. So again, status, stash, L, primary. So mirror pair, mirror pair, uh, I scrub at like 500 megabytes per second, which is insane. And then especially with this, like the special VDEV now, these SSDs, like metadata lookups, small files, like it's all effectively instant. So uh, this is by far the best pool I've ever had. Uh, Exos are great and louder, not that hot thanks to Helium. Yeah, so Dominic actually raises a good point there about the, the noise. Um, I live in a house in the Midwest. I have a basement. I don't care about noise. Um, certainly, if this is in your New York apartment, it might be different. Um, sensors, HDD temp, right? Uh, no, drive temp. So some of these are SATA, but yeah, in my basement, you know, 20 Celsius, 22, 25, 28, like these are not running hot at all. Um, some of these are the SSDs though, and that's the problem is I don't remember, I don't actually know off the top of my head, like which of these are SSDs and which are drives, but... Um, 
certainly they are all running quite cool in my basement, which is good. So you have some, you said you have some old Seagates. Yeah, I, Exos are amazing. There is literally, as far as I'm concerned, there is no reason to ever buy an Iron Wolf because Exos are effectively the same price, have a huge warranty, they have better specs, better firmware. Like, they're great. Uh, huge fan. So, and they're also 7,200 RPM, which is nice because I was running WD Reds forever. You could really tell that the array, it struggled a little bit in some areas. Oh, yours for hand-me-downs? Yeah, for sure. Hard drives are expensive. I mean, my new ZFS pool between the drives and the SSDs probably cost about $1,500. And I also have a $100 HBA SAS adapter. So, Iron Wolves include backup or data recovery or something interesting. I, I guess for me, I manage that myself. Iron Wolves have extra smart data. Uh, but I feel like Exos would have that too because Exos has the enterprise firmware. So I feel like Exos would have the same smart data as an Iron Wolf. Yep, exactly. Cool, cool. Um... I, yeah, I love home lab -y stuff. It's, it's too much fun. So code, HTTP status, method not allowed. The person that gave you the Seagates replaced with Exos. Exos has more data. Cool, yeah. Exos are amazing, big fan. So, so we're gonna set this up properly. So we got the URL, The we got the URL. We're gonna have a body, which is gonna be I guess effectively fixed, but um, let's see. So HTTP new request does not implement. Oh, it's because I'm shadowing. Okay. No big deal. You think you merged Samsung Exynos and WD Exos to get Exios? Yeah, no, you're all good. I, I knew what you meant, so I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna correct you, but you're good. <laughs> Exos or Seagate, yes, also true. Oh, you know what, here's another uh, MD layer style thing I would not historically do, but now I do. If I don't need, if I don't need anything else on this, if I'm just declaring and calling a method right away, I'll inline it like this too. Um, that's a, a new, sorry, that's a new MD layer style as well. You're hella confused now. Yeah, so WD Reds, so WD Red is their consumer NAS. Seagate Iron Wolf are their consumer NAS. For Enterprise, WD has the Golds, I believe. Golds are their Enterprise. Uh, Seagate has Exos. Uh, Samsung, I don't think they make drives anymore, do they? Or I think I thought they sold that business to somebody. I, I could be wrong. I think they made hard drives, rather. I know they make SSDs, of course. But... Samsung does not make drives... WD Red are a bloody scam. Yes, uh, I was running WDs for like a decade, but I switched back to Seagate because WD Reds, they were doing the thing where they were putting shingled recording drives in their cheaper models and not telling you, which uh, shingled drives, I think in ZFS, I believe are really, really bad. Uh, Samsung hard drives got bought by Seagate like a decade ago. Cool. Yeah, I thought it was pretty much just Seagate and WD these days, but I was not totally sure about that. Okay, um, bad method. All right, so I got to modify the request. So, um, yeah, we're not about drives, but. So the way I like to write these kinds of tests is as follows. Um, So basically what we are doing here 
is we have this test table here. So the name of the test, first of all, the body we're gonna get to in a little bit, the modification function, and finally the output. So instead of saying, I wanna create an HTTP request every single time here, creating it manually with all these fields, I create a correct one and I have an optional function here that will modify it in some way to make it wrong. So for example, this already has the proper URL, the proper method, the proper body, everything. And I just say, okay, take that, but make it a get instead. And then we get an error. So I think this is a really good way to test complicated structs. Um, I, I just, I like this approach. So this is something that I use quite frequently. So hope this is uh, useful. So, and we're gonna do the same thing here. So we're gonna change the URL, right? Equals, uh, post, uh, oh no, we gotta change the path. So just the path. Uh, status not found. Yep. So for here, we get a 404, and then we get the 405 as well. So I think this is pretty good. Uh, even before SMR, so shingled magnetic recording, the technology WD is using these days, and I think Seagate as well for some things, but not Exos. Uh, even before SMR, WD Red just was not all that great. Little smart data, not really any better than their desktop drives, just that magic firmware and a big price increase. Yeah, I mean, they, they certainly sold me. They certainly sold me a while back. Like I was running Reds back when, I want to say I owned three terabyte, four terabyte, and eight terabyte Reds. So I had bought them for three generations of my uh, home storage stuff. And before that, I was running WD Greens. So uh, yeah, I'd been buying WD for quite a long time. These are my first Seagates in over a decade. You were a sucker too. <laughs> Uh, Jimmy, you so rarely write HTTP handler tests in Go. Yeah, I think this is a, I think this sort of test is like one of the most broadly applicable lessons for folks who are fairly new to Go because like I think this really exercises like it demonstrates how you can test these things effectively. Um, so I, I really like this pattern a lot because um, lots of folks are building HTTP APIs in Go. Not many people are doing weird Linux syscall unsafe pointer yellow, you know, like I am. So. Uh, you buy the cheapest, you trust backups and generally different brands to not fail at the same time. Uh, yeah, that's fair. I, I, I can totally understand that philosophy. Um, for me, I knew I wanted higher performance this time around as well. So uh, the Exos, the 7200 RPM drives, you know, I don't care about the noise because I have a basement. So I put them down there. The HTTP test library has some good stuff like the response recorder. Yes, it does. I still prefer the new server because this actually does a network round trip locally and it verifies that like all of the network logic is also correct. The problem is with like HTTP response recorder is you're basically doing like a function call, which is fine, but you don't get to exercise things like context, timeouts, et cetera, if those things matter. So I have always opted for HTTP test server and I've never really looked back. Um, I did remember using the response recorder, but uh, HTTP tests, let's close all of these really quick. Yeah, so there is the response recorder. Um, yeah, I, I just, I prefer to do just a proper HTTP request instead. Oh, for passing, added and go 1.7, interesting. Panics on error for ease of use in testing where you panic. Added and go 1.7, really? Did I just, I feel like I knew about this, but I forgot. Today I learned, uh, yeah, me too. Um, so I think I actually want this, but HTTP test, new request, method target body. Um, yeah, sure. Test.new request. Cool. Um, well, we all learned something together today. That's neat. Also works just fine. So I will go ahead and swap my other uses with it as well. Um, yeah, it is, uh, <laughs> it's not often I discover something that I should have been using that's 11 Go releases old. So today was, a today was a pretty good day. In fact, I think we should tweet about this. So, uh, let's see here. <laughs> I've been writing that HTTP, uh, I've been writing that HTTP code since... 
Go 1.0 and today I learned that exists and was added in Go 1.7 <laughs> 11 releases ago. Oops. <laughs> Hashtag Golang. <laughs> Pretty funny. You should start gripping your code now. Yeah, me too. I actually am gonna use this like all over the place. Like I, I just had no idea. So yeah, I just uh, did the did the tweeters. Pretty funny. <laughs> maybe I maybe this is a little this URL is a little opaque. That's okay. I'll leave it alone. But yeah, cool. Lesson learned. Um, yeah, so we have a couple other places we could use that as well, I believe, client. Um, no, the client actually does need to construct a request itself, so at least just that one place is fine. Um, yeah, cool. Twitter didn't for all that as well as I had hoped. The API is HTTP test new request. It's like HTTP new request, but more opinionated and panics on error. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, so now we just need to test the other parts. So we've got not found, we've got bad method. Um, we've got, I guess we should match the HTTP name, so method not allowed. We'll also do bad request. Ooh, I smell chili, it smells good. I love chili. Yeah, it's still kind of cold here in Michigan. We've had a little bit of snow the past couple of days, even just like little flurries here on and off. I'm hoping that we're done at this point, so we can go eventually go mountain biking and such again. Uh, my bikes are ready to go. It's just that the ground's been wet and cold, and I don't want to go tear up the trails, so I'm just waiting for it to dry out some. So we got post, bad request, content type, and payload. Okay. Uh, right, so I need to set the header too. So request header set content type. Ad hook content JSON. Okay. Um, now the reason I put this into a constant is because it gets really annoying to type this out over and over again. Like I feel like this is just subtle enough. Like application, you can misspell that. You can forget the semicolon. You forget the space. The UTF-8. Like there's just so many weird, annoying things about this header. So I just use this as a constant as well. Um, okay. So. Method not allowed. Next up we have, we're gonna do a bad request. So bad content type. Bad request content type. Header set content type. Uh, what's the plain text, right? Is it just text, text plain? Is that what it is? I, I forget actually. Code HTTP.status bad request. Cool. And then we do one more for the bad request uh, JSON body. Okay, Dominic and Jimmy both said yes at the same time. Sweet, thanks. <laughs> this is what's great about Twitch chat is that like I can Google by using my voice. I mean, I guess I've got the Google Home thing too, but it's like, I'm like, oh, what's that again? And I have, you know, folks over here who can help me out. Um, with silly things like that, so. Oh, alert firing. Oh, you know what? I think on my server earlier, I think I forgot to. <laughs> You're just lucky you'd have good folks in chat. Yeah, that's a good point. I think I stopped at ZREPL earlier because one of my pools was having trouble. So status dash L. I found a couple of things recently where some combination of ZREPL, like doing snapshots and replication and scrubbing running at the same time, in certain cases, I've locked up ZFS and I have no idea why. Um, it's certainly a little concerning, but it seems to mostly be a problem with my backup drives. So as long as those aren't plugged in, I think we're okay. 
So right now I've just got the primary pool, the secondary, it is scrubbing, but I think we're okay to turn Z Repl back on at this point. Uh, this is a good old start, Z Repl. So yeah, Prometheus sent me an alert that Z Repl has not been running because I stopped it on purpose. Okay, acknowledge. And pretty much any time now, it should also just clear, which is nice. <laughs> I love uh, I love having monitoring set up for the house. It's honestly been great. Oh God, Prometheus. Well, I mean, Jimmy, I have a spoiler for you. My intent is to hook all this this system into Prometheus is what I'm going to do with it. So that way I can make sure that like, hey, uh, the ZFS pool hasn't been scrubbed in two weeks or uh, the pool hasn't been trimmed in a while. You've been trying to find a managed Prometheus that does not charge insanity. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have any options for you. I know at PlanetScale right now, we are rolling out Thanos. At DigitalOcean, we were rolling out Thanos. I think at Fastly as well, actually, like shit, all three. Um, so I, I think ultimately we we had gotten to the point where, you know, they were all very expensive and it's like, well, we can do this ourselves by running Thanos. So I know you probably don't want to do that, but that's three for three companies I've worked for in the past that are now doing that, so... Have you tried Mimir, uh, Managed Prometheus? Oh yeah, Mimir is, ah, tra Tracing, no. Mimir is, oh it is like, it is like a, um, it's the new Cortex essentially, right? Like it's kind of like a fork of Cortex. Uh, Mimir is a Cortex fork, Grafana Cloud pricing sucks. Yeah, fair enough. I, I've never looked at Grafana Cloud product. Um, certainly I appreciate their open source projects, you know, and Mimir seems interesting, but I think lots of folks I've worked with are invested in Thanos already. Can I modify the response body here? So I guess here's what I could do is I could just, uh, cool. Uh, HTTP request URI can't be set and client requests. Uh, excuse me? Oh. Request URI can't be set in client requests, fail to perform HTTP. Is that the HTTP test API? Hang on one sec. Request uh, URI. I don't see anything here about URI. Um, what's this doing? Um, host, hmm. I don't see anything in here about that. How did I mess that up? Let's, let's dig in just a little bit, hang on. Bit of conversation still going on here about pricing for these things. Um, same people, AWS pricing is good and just as Cortex as well. GCP is a weird proxy in front of Monarch that forces you basically run Prometheus yourself still. Yeah, Grafana's not giving me money yet, so you know, not a good look for them. If there's any folks here who work for Grafana Labs, uh, please do sponsor Dominic. I'm trying to get Planet Scale. Actually, now I have connections in the marketing department. I can probably make it happen. Uh, <laughs> so I will be pursuing that again, Dominic, just so you know. The amount of time it's taken for me to provision and make the managed Prometheus stack reasonable, you may as well just set up Thanos. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, all I can, I, I have not had to operate any of these. I'm just, the only thing I can share is that uh, I have worked for several companies that are doing Thanos because managed Prometheus is so expensive. So, is that a Grand Pooh Bear? Nice. I didn't know you watched Grand Pooh Bear. Uh, yeah, I watch a lot of I watch a lot of Barb. Um, I do love Pooh as well, but I when when Pooh started doing all the Grand Theft Auto roleplay, uh, I had to step away. I just wasn't interested. You know, <laughs> we got a, we got a couple of Pooh subscribers in here. Uh, I, I watch a ton of, yeah, Barbarous King on Twitch. I watch, Barb is my favorite. Um, he's, so Barb is the creator of Grand Pooh World 1 and 2. And he's also the guy working on Grand Pooh World 3. Um, he is a really funny dude. Um, I, I think you would appreciate him, Dominic. He plays a pretty wide variety of games. Uh, but I think he's playing like Super Mario Galaxy 2 right now, which has been a ton of fun to watch. So uh, would definitely recommend if you're interested in the Mario community. Why? Okay, so... Post not found, request URI can't be set, but I'm not setting it, I don't think. You got gifted a sub to Barb, interesting. Did Jordan, did a large data bank just do that? 
I, I guess it doesn't matter. I can call you Jordan too on stream. You don't really care, but I, I always forget if people want to go by their handle or, oh, you did not. Okay. I was going to say, I can gift him a, I can gift him a sub to, uh, to Barb as well, but. Uh, failed to perform HTTP request. So what's wrong with this? The request URI cannot be set in client requests. I don't actually understand. <laughs> what's up church? Barb Cribby. I didn't realize my brother, my brother was watching right now. He's got the, the Barb emote. You need to write a bot to idle in every stream so you can win a random gift sub. Nice. A random gift sub a couple days ago. Uh, Luke, you can't believe you were forced to watch ads to get into this stream. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I uh, I don't make much money off Twitch, but I make I make just a little bit, and pretty much all of it goes back to Dominic. So that works out pretty well. But thanks for thanks for watching ads on my behalf. Uh, what's going on here, gang? Um, I don't understand. I, is this something that this function is doing for me? Like, I have no idea why this would be setting the request URI, right? Um, do I just unset that or something? Uh, what is, okay, what is request URI? I've actually never looked at that field, I don't think. So me being sub to you, only Twitch is benefiting from that. Um, I guess technically that would be a, a true statement because you're giving me money, I'm giving you money. Um, yeah. So. As sent by the client to a server. Um, wait, so that was reading the response. So why? Hang on. Does that fix it? Yes, it does. Uh, why? Oh, a new incoming server request suitable for passing to an HTTP handler for testing. Oh, so you're not supposed to use this for client requests. A new incoming server request. Ah, I see. Uh, you and Daniel sponsor each other in GitHub too. Nice. Yeah. I sponsor Daniel as well. <laughs> My brother, my brother says, make me a mod. I do good, making sure we only stick to computer words here. Very technical, as I'm sure you know. Uh, we were playing Roller Coaster Tycoon, and my brother suggested the ride name Partitioned Kernels for a racing roller coaster. And I was like, that doesn't really make sense, but it sounds good, so I'm going to go with it. So Partitioned Kernels was the name of my roller coaster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All the computer words here. <laughs> Hang on, did I tweet about that? I think I might have actually um, forever ago. Hang on, Twitter. I hate that Twitter won't let you do the media view without logging in. That's really annoying. So I'm going to hop over here really quick. Um, I, I feel like I tweeted about that forever ago. I'm going to try and find it. It was really funny. Occasionally, I will get on a, a bit of a thing where I want to play Roller Coaster Tycoon again. And uh, it's it's a good time. Oh, here we go. I found it. So this this tweet right here. My first Mobius racing coaster tonight it turned out amazing. Partitioned kernels. Yeah, I did good. I fucking crushed this one. Look at this shit. 8.24. That's an amazing rating. Like, I don't know how many Roller Coaster Tycoon fans there are here, but like, I was freaking proud of myself for this shit. <laughs> so Partitioned Kernels was a, a great ride name. Oh, I forgot too. The name Partitioned Kernels is courtesy of Luke because he apparently hears me say stuff like that all the time, along with PVP6, which is what he thinks IPv6 is. <laughs> Hashtag go make me a mod. We need more must functions in that IP. Uh, Jimmy, if you have good, if you have ones that you want, just open issues for it. I'd be happy to look at it too. PVE6, please. If they survive, it's not intense enough. Let's go to Luke's. Let's go to Luke's tweets really quick. Um, almost always they are in response to. So first of all, look at this crappy mustache. Like this is uh, some serious low quality content. I have no idea why he would uh, you know go with this as a profile picture. Seriously, pretty terrible. Uh, tweets and replies. Let's see here. Uh, let's just grab. Let's just grab a few. This roast on stream. Wow, doxed. Progress, hashtag Russ Lang. Oh, this is my NBD client. 
Luke says, you've only made this much progress. I did this like seven years ago in a cave with a box of scraps. That is a great quote. Yeah, I know most of your tweets are to me. Yeah, there's a reason I pulled them up. Uh, Core Red has reached version 1.0. Thank you. No problem, Matt. Happy to be your rock, your mentor, and your all-around source of radical ideas. Go show people what I taught you. PVP me IRL. Remember when I tested it and it was bad, but then I told you that and you made it not bad. Chat audit me. Yeah, this is uh, this is some serious quality content here. So if anybody wants to follow Luke, um, pretty much all he does is roast me. So... <laughs> Oh, here we go. Here's hard drives. Um, new hard drive day. The plan is to replace my Z pool. So this is the, during the migration that was the setup. Um, it's a little bit different now, but yeah, I've been using the Gamer Z38 with K-Lake client 10X 42 terabytes. The space gate mirrors are fully clothed, but yours stripping is a life choice that's not mine to judge. I understand technology as well as you. Seagate Exos striped mirrors. K-Lake client, space gate mirrors, fully clothed, but your stripping, you know, just goes on and on. So pretty good. <laughs> um, where the heck were we? Oh, we were looking at this, weren't we? The request URI. So it's not quite right, I guess. So to do MD layer, this really is, so this is supposed to be for an incoming server request. So uh, I don't know. It works otherwise. Maybe we shouldn't use it. You're done derailing. Yeah, not a problem. I, I mean, I pulled it up on purpose, you know. I uh, We're not going to be going for too much longer anyway. I'll probably just get a little bit more done. Um, maybe we won't use this for now because of this. This seems suspect, you know. ART fatal F. And I guess I should amend my tweet as well, shouldn't I? So... Anyway, incoming server request. And I want to use this on the client side, so maybe I don't want this after all. Uh, just learned something else. Specifically, the incoming server request part. I wanted to use this for a client, but got errors due to request URI being set. Seems I'm back. Guess I won't use it for now. Uh, I want to use this for a client, but to request URI, I guess I won't use it for now. Specifically the so request part. Sorry, I'm trying to tweet craft over here. Anyway. Yeah, Luke's tweets are absolutely high quality. Uh, failed to create HTTP request. I gotta say though, partition kernels, that's the last comment, oh, I lost it, but partition kernels was a top tier roller coaster and top tier roller coaster name. So it's pretty funny, man. Uh, body is empty or a slice of bytes. If set, modify the valid request to make it invalid in some form. And ultimately, yeah, we want to make sure we never get a payload. You have a suggestion for my roller coaster, Sam. What do you got, Dominic? I haven't played Roller Coaster Tycoon in probably uh, a year and a half, something that's been a while, so. I think we were drinking at my house one time though and somebody challenged me to like build a roller coaster with like a certain rating while we were drinking. And I was like, yeah, I got this. Split brain. <laughs> nice, that's a good one too. Um, all requests should return non-204. And no payload. Cool. Uh, I feel like we're probably got pretty good test coverage now, hopefully. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so there is the peer cards thing we talked about earlier. 
I should name one the Blade of Mikella because you've heard that about 10 million times. Anybody else playing Elden Ring? I know uh, Luke is, and I think he's been stuck on Millennia for a week now, something like that. He sent a tweet that, or he sent a Snapchat of him screaming the first time he got to phase two. So, yep, I take it you still suck. <laughs> uh, I've watched a couple streamers play Millennia, and it was rough. Five hours. Uh, so it took you five hours to get to phase two or to beat her. Um, for context, Melania, I won't do any spoilers, but Melania is a endgame optional boss, and she's very, very hard. So it's been pretty entertaining. I can do it better sometimes. Phase two. Ah, I see. So you still have not beaten her. <laughs> pretty good. Cool. Um, connection close, server. Hmm. I guess probably we want to set these up front because anytime anybody contacts us. Or no, we don't want to we don't want to defer these. We want to set them everywhere. So we want to set these first, right? I know defers are like a stack, but for some reason in my head that doesn't work out. So if I do like this. And this, I find this like non-obvious to parse. So I will write this instead now every time um, because I just think this is more reasonable. Of course, the case where you've got like, you know, your R body, so defer R and you got your G zip body, defer G, like that's more fine. But if there's two defers in a row, I just group them now. All right. Twitch, or not Twitch, uh, Spotify got a little angsty over here. Let's uh, change it up. There we go. Your two versions work differently. Uh, yes, you're correct. No, you're right. But the thing is, is that like, I find the reverse ordering of the stack when there's two lines in a low unintuitive. So that's why I grouped these because it's like, yes, I want both of these to happen in a row, but I want to make sure they are tied together as a single logical operation. So, but yes, you are correct. Um, you know, the, the equivalent would have been this, right? Uh, so, you know, there are cases where it's useful to use the stack, but if I'm deferring two things in a row, I just group them together and put them in the order I want. Because for me, in my head, that makes more sense. You think it's less overhead to do one defer? I believe either way, I think either way, this just expands to this. Like, I, I think that regardless, um, there's still a call. But yes, I guess there would be one less extra call. Right, 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 it does. Cool, cool, cool. So I think I'm right here. Unconditionally uh, set headers. We always close. Terminate connections. We expect uh, client connections to be one shot requests from a Zedlet and therefore from the Zedlet and therefore there's no advantage to keep alive. Cool. And I guess I can check for those headers just to verify that we actually get what we want. Should I bother checking for the server name? Probably not. I think that would be unnecessary. Maybe in the test, if anything. Um, you know, I have a bad habit of always fatal effing everything, but in reality, everything below here should be an error F because the request is already done. At this point, we want to report as many errors as possible. So uh, there's a cost of the closure, but I think the defer has a closure anyway. And I think that even with that, the closure, I believe, is optimized away due to open coded defers in 114, I think, right? Uh, open coded defer. This is, this is an interesting read. So um, defers became much, much cheaper in a couple of Go releases ago. Uh, so I, I'm not a compiler person. I frankly have forgotten almost all of the details about this, but uh, check it out if you're interested.
50. My higher genius is for the runtime team. Uh, yes, that is, yeah. It's like, I think I'm a pretty good programmer. I, I would call myself like pretty good, um, but I am not, I'm not go runtime team level. I don't think, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, you do not remember the details, but you imagine any large defer is not going to be inlineable. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure to be honest. Um, I'm just gonna always do the dumbest, simplest thing that works for my for my little brain. <laughs> so we were talking. Um, I was talking to my friends about like you know the school where you get your degree from, and I remember you know Digital Ocean would hire interns from like MIT and these other great schools, and I'm like, yeah, I went to Western Michigan University. My CS program was kind of a joke in some ways. Um, you know. The real genius lies in creativity, thinking of optimizations like those. Yeah, absolutely. And I, yeah, I got nothing close. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm certainly thankful for my college experience, but I would be in really bad shape if I didn't do side projects on my own and kind of build my way up myself. Um, the entire reason I work at digital, I worked for DigitalOcean was because I was doing like side projects. And ever since then, you know, at this point, it's like all about who you know. And going to conferences, making friends, et cetera, is great. Uh, do you get any genius points for reverse engineering the runtime bitmaps for Viewcore? Yeah, that's dope. I'm that's the dude, that's super cool. So yes, I would give you I give you some genius points. You had the same college experience, Jimmy. Yeah, totally. Uh my my CS degree taught me some useful things. Like my systems programming class and my computer networks classes were really good, but a lot of them were not great. A lot of the the classes were uh you know, there was one where like they taught us how to use like SOAP APIs in like 2011 or 2012 and it's like nobody's used SOAP, you know, like ever. And it's just yuck, you know. Uh, what was else was I gonna verify? Oh, the headers. So I want, let's see here. Header get server. Some of our government APIs use SOAP. Uh, yes, but I have no intent of ever working on a government API. So <laughs> I uh, I mean, I guess frankly, like I didn't realize startups existed when I graduated. So I kind of thought I'd be working for some kind of whatever, um, you know, company here in Michigan. And then I discovered, you know, DigitalOcean ultimately and that totally changed the course of my life. So you had a good RDBMS course run by a guy that carries the pager for almost all the hospitals on the East Coast. Yeah, that's wild. Actually, my, my database course was pretty good too. You, th you that I think was genuinely it. Yeah, that's that's insane. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I had. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Or no, my database course was pretty good too. They taught us Oracle, but you know Oracle and PL SQL, but it was still pretty cool. Uh, unexpected server header. Server HTTP header, right? Oh, interesting. Um, you know, I suppose we could do, we can just do this, right? So, although, you know, I guess this, here's an interesting point. I probably don't want to set connection close because of the fact that Prometheus, I imagine, will want to come back regularly. So, uh, so we'll set the server everywhere, but down here we will set. Uh, we expect client uh, push requests to be one shot. Client push to be So client push use one shot requests from the Zedlet and therefore there's no advantage to keep alive. So yeah, so we will put the server header up here, but for Prometheus, we will leave it alone because we don't want to close Prometheus connections, right? Uh, with recent Go versions, there is a trend to change the PC int tab, PC LN tab with details that matter, but these details are not part of the API stable promise so far. Uh, Flo, I'd be curious to hear I'd be curious to hear what you have in mind, um, or if there's like a if there's like a CL or a proposal. I, I guess I, I know almost nothing about this, but I'd be curious to read about it. So please do share if you have more details. Dominic says, when I was 18, I figured I'd work for Google one day. In my early 20s, I realized I would hate that. Yes, me too. Um, not only would I not pass the algorithms test, the algorithms interview, uh, yeah, I just don't think I would like it. 
Um, I don't want to go work on Google internal team tool. Like I'm good. Startups are definitely where I'm most happy. So there was a little bit where I kind of wanted to work on like the go team, but I don't think I would even like that to be honest. You know, I just, I, I much prefer being in the community. So You feel like I would have fun. You feel like I would have fun doing networking stuff at Google scale, Matt. Uh, you know so much a level about it. Yeah, maybe. Um, that's possible. Yeah, I, I, I would be curious to like learn about it, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Just I, anymore, like having been through DigitalOcean fastly and now Planet Scale now, like I just feel like a smaller company is really where it's at because I can tell it's kind of inevitable with startups, right? So I was DO from 50 people to about 500 and things changed quite a bit. And then it fast like from about 300 to 1,000 or 1,100. And that was a big change too. Um, so I can only imagine what things are like at much, much larger companies. And as a result, I am pretty hesitant to join a big org um, because I really appreciate the freedom and the flexibility of a small org. You know, I think that's just my personal preference. I know there's like less stability, um, but I feel like I was able to jump into Planet Scale, and it's like I had HR onboarding, IT onboarding, and it's like, all right, have fun, find stuff to work on. You know, it wasn't exactly like that, but I was like, huh, this looks weird. Oh, this is a weird go thing. Oh, there's a race condition here. There's lots of stuff we can fix. And I would just go do that. And that was great. So you guys fastly seems like very high scale too. Yeah, totally. Um, and I definitely learned a lot. You know, I built like an internet facing BGP demon. You know, we the, the thing earlier in the stream reducing uh, logging allocations because they were dominating our, our GC and everything. Um, you know, so that was that was a good time as well. But I ultimately was just looking for more autonomy in my work. And I think I have that at Planet Scale. Just build the Google thing outside of Google. Uh yeah, pretty much, Jimmy. <laughs> Am I working on uh Vitesse or Planet Scale core platform offerings? Just curious. Uh yeah, little bit little bits and pieces of everything. So I work on the orchestration team. So we are basically the backend API and the Kubernetes operator behind the Rails API. Um, there are times where I have touched little bits and pieces of the test, and there are times where I've touched little bits and pieces of the Rails app, but primarily I'm working on the Go systems that are in between those. So uh, it's been a really good time. I have made some pretty significant contributions already. I've cleaned up a lot of things that were problematic or you know, I saw that could be problematic or were causing us trouble, and it's been a lot of fun. So I'm getting to work kind of all over the place, which is pretty cool. Yeah, this is looking pretty good to me now. I feel good about this. I kind of want to add Prometheus support today too, and then maybe we'll we'll call it. Um, yeah, I've got to be gone by two o'clock at the latest, so probably be done by like one thirty. Go have some lunch before I see some folks today. Internal Z hook, um, initial handler tests. Actually, well, these are so invalid HTTP request tests. Yeah, that's what those are. Yeah, I almost did the same commit message twice in a row. That would have been a mistake. <laughs> uh, Dominic says, yeah, but huge corporate management hell at Google. Uh, I mean, I've never worked there, so I don't know, but it's possible. Jimmy says, do you find lots of Rails users and Next.js users, and you get far more enterprise interest than large scale managed database, you know? Uh, yeah, actually, um, I think PlanetScale is very popular in the Next.js, like the JavaScript community in general. There are lots of folks doing like PlanetScale, Prisma. Um, I, I forget some of the others. There are lots of folks doing Rails too. I haven't heard about a whole lot of Go, but it's just MySQL. And it's, you know, it's MySQL that you don't have to worry about. So, um, the next time I reach for MySQL, I'm going to use Planet Scale for sure. Like it's, it makes no sense to host your own by comparison. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like I, I think in general, we, we've attracted a lot of attention from, you know, a lot of individual developers, which has been really great, but also some companies too, which has been really cool. So, um, I forget what exactly I'm allowed to talk about, but anything, if you go to our website, anything on the website, of course, like, you know, customers listed there are folks that like, you know, trust us too. So yeah, pretty cool. I need to make this configurable. Um, 
So I think this thing needs a config file ultimately, which is gonna be, you know, knowing me a Toml file, but. Uh, you're very impressed with Planet Scale's DX developer experience, right? Focus, you guys are extremely good at that. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, certainly I, you know, I I don't I know that I guess technically Cockroach and Planet Scale may be considered competitors in some ways. I, I think that, you know, I certainly respect the hell out of you as an engineer as well as the work I've seen done at your company and everything else. So um, you know, I think it's really, really cool that like, you know, people can build these cool database products in Go that enable these massive scale out workflows and can solve different use cases, you know? Um, Jordan, oh man, we were talking, we were talking about like Postgres extensions and I did not realize like, doesn't post GIS run on Cockroach? Like post GIS is this crazy like geospatial database thing. And like, I think it actually works in Cockroach now, which I think is incredibly cool because I know this is something that's like extraordinarily specialized for, uh, for use in Postgres. And the fact that that works in Cockroach is awesome. So I'm, I'm, I think that's super neat. Yes, you implemented PostGIS on Cockroach. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, Jimmy says, we definitely plan to copy some of the online schema migration workflows. Yeah, totally. I, I have no idea. Um, let's see here. Uh, we run our PG unit tests against po Postgres and Cockroach. Yeah, nice. I Yeah, I have no idea. You know, I mean, certainly the idea, I guess, of like doing like a deploy request and stuff. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of surprised nobody came up with it sooner, to be honest. Um, assuming Planet Scale is the first, I, I don't know, but. Uh, Dominic says, when I first heard of Cockroach DB years ago, I thought they were crazy, but they've come so far. Yeah, totally. Oh, Flo, so you posted the, you need some time to look up the CL with some of the Go internal changes. It's good to look for Go 112, 16, 18 magic. Interesting. So. Use offset for func entry. The first field of the func data stored by the linker is the entry PC for the function. Ooh, excuse me. Uh, reduces the number of relocations on Darwin by 10% and shrinks binaries. Incrementally speed up binary launching towards removing enough relocations that pages that were previously dirtied by the loader may remain clean, which may offer, which will offer useful memory savings in constrained environments. Yeah, that's. This is wild. I mean, as Josh certainly knows his stuff as well, but like this is all beyond me. Uh, pretty cool. Basically everyone has online schema tooling like PS, but they don't have good DX for it. Yeah, no, for sure. I guess um, I, I, I don't remember exactly what I said, but thinking back, like I remember using PT online schema change years and years ago and there was a problem with it and we had to roll the whole thing back. And now like Planet Scale announced the, the rewind thing. I had a, I didn't actually contribute directly to that, but I did a bunch of like code reviews and stuff. And like rewind is something that I would have killed to have like that day when my online schema change went wrong because I had to roll forward and then roll all the way back and being able to do a rewind would have been clutch. So um, the developer experience is very important for sure. The atomic cutover to a new table isn't perfect and we literally couldn't even use that strategy once for online migrations for Quay. Hmm. These are neat CLs to learn from. Yeah, totally. I, I love checking out like the runtime and compiler team like meeting notes and such. It's just that frankly, a lot of it is beyond my level of knowledge on these topics, you know. Um, I guess at this point, like I'm somewhat of like a networking expert or like a Linux expert in some ways, but you get to like certain topics like compilers, PL theory, uh, all of that. And it's like, I just have no idea. You know, it's like I can configure an IP stack in my sleep, but <laughs> you know. Oh, thank you. Register Samsung SSDs. Um, how did that bypass the GNOME? I've got do not disturb on a GNOME. So Google Calendar just YOLO bypassed it, I guess. All right. Well, that's good to know. I'll make a note for myself to close not only Thunderbird, but also close Google Calendar. <laughs> Close Thunderbird and Google Calendar. Cool. <laughs> Silly. Yeah, we're gonna want a config file for this. I don't really want to deal with it right now. Um, I don't know. You know, we just hit two hours. I am getting to the point where I'm a little hungry and such. Maybe this is a good time to call it for today. It was gonna be a short stream anyway. 
Um, we got a bit done. I think this test is pretty good. I encourage folks who are writing HTTP applications in Go. MD layer Z hook. Uh, Z hook server test. Yeah, I think these tests are really good. Uh, I feel I feel really good about this because like this is a super common flow where you want to create a request, send it to the server, do something. And I think that this strategy is really, really obvious and nice because you take a valid request, you modify it slightly, make it invalid. That's awesome, you know. Net IP unmap is, is that an emote? Is that an onion or like a phases of the moon emote or an emoji? I can't tell. Uh, so the net IP adder, hang on. Oh gosh. Unmap. It's a crying happy emoji, happy emoji. It does not show up like that on Linux. It shows up like, I'll send a screenshot or something, but that's super weird, man. Uh, can I pop out Twitch chat actually? I have no idea what that's showing up as. Yeah, look at this, like. <laughs> face holding back tears. Yeah, I okay, so I guess that my Linux is just not updated for that. I thought it was like a an onion or something. <laughs> cool. Um, how do I pop this back in? My chat, there we go, okay. Cool. I think I'm reconnected to chat now, hopefully. I guess we'll find out. But yeah, so the unmap stuff is great because I frankly think this IPv4 mapped stuff in the standard library was a mistake. Like the fact that you call net IPv4 and it gives you back a, a slice of 16 bytes in the IPv6 map format is nothing anybody would expect. Like I have no idea why anybody would want these behaviors. Like I do networking and I think that this is something that like was a thing in the mid 2000s and for some reason it stuck around with Go and I think that's unfortunate. So net IP makes it better for sure. Um, there is also, there's the is four and six. So you can check this as well. So for all my IPv6 stuff, I say is six and not is four and six. Um, these are so much better than before too. So there've been a lot of improvements and things, but. You liked the idea of v6 map before? Uh, yeah, I just, it's not real. It's not reflective of reality. You know, like dual stack is here to stay. So um, with, with dual stack being around these days, like there's no reason to, there's no reason to use this anymore. I don't think so. I don't know. Anyway, you always coerce it to four. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah, well, reality is dumb for sure. All right, gang, um, I think we're gonna wrap the stream here because uh, PVP six, math PVP four, I think you mean, yeah, my brother, gosh. Um, I think we're gonna send a stream over to, how about RWX Rob? Um, we raided Christoph IT yesterday. We were working on Zig stuff. Um, I wanna send a, a raid over to RWX Rob. Um, I think that he works on Go stuff. I'm not sure what he's building today, but project coding, Go, Bonsai, Yoga, cool. Um, so I will send you all over to Rob. And I hope that you all have a great day. Um, it's been super fun hanging out and everything. Certainly appreciate it. And yeah, take care. Have a great weekend. I'll be back probably in, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks at this point. I guess we'll see. So, all right, folks. See you later. <laughs>